next on Viewpoint. With more states making it legal, today we'll hear from a pastor and his viewpoint on the recreational use of marijuana. So now that it's legalized, there's a lot of questions from people who've been walking with you, so how, how are we supposed to navigate that? And later, how do our media choices affect our spirit and our mind? Mature people are mature enough to say no. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Currently, eight states have laws allowing recreational use of marijuana. Well, after the next election, there will be even more. Currently, over 30 states have legalized medical marijuana. Plus, the industry itself is becoming a major financial player in our economy. Where does the Bible stand on believers who are asking the question, can I have cannabis? Daniel Fusco is the pastor of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver and Portland. He's author of the book, Upward, Inward, and Outward. And it's been six years since the state of Washington legalized marijuana for recreational purposes. And Daniel, uh, thanks for joining us today. Has there been any, any big issues with questions about you and other faith leaders about whether or not recreational use of marijuana is a sin? Or is it, how, do, how do you handle that in your church? Well, absolutely. That's a question that we get uh, pretty regularly, not only from uh, people who are uh, exploring Jesus uh, at Crossroads, not people who would be uh, people of faith per se, but uh, also now that it's legalized, there's a lot of questions from people who've been walking with Jesus. So how, how are we supposed to navigate that? So the, the first thing that I always say as it relates to, um, to marijuana is there is a legitimate medical uh, reasons that, that a doctor would prescribe uh, marijuana uh, to, to be able to deal with different health issues. So I always make a distinction between under a doctor's care as opposed to recreational use because we have to make that distinction because there are legitimate medical uses for it. As it relates to uh, the recreational use of not only marijuana but, but pretty much anything else, I always make the case that the Bible is really interested in what, what influence are you under. So there's that beautiful mm -hmm. passage uh, in the book of Ephesians that says that uh, we should be under the influence of the Holy Spirit as opposed to being drunk with wine. And so really what God is interested in for us as humans is that we would be under the influence of His Spirit and not anything else. And so that's really where the crux of the issue lands for us as we talk about it here at Crossroads. So we're, we're talking about with the recreational use, we're talking about it's a, a, an hallucinogen. Do you differentiate that with someone who's using casually using wine at home? Well, so yeah, so the, the, with the idea of alcohol, obviously as it relates to the Bible, if we were being real stringent, the Bible is against drunkenness, which our mm. laws today would characterize as being under the influence of it. Now, um, the idea of being able to drink a glass of wine and not being under it, its influence from a biblical perspective, a fermented drink was one of the most safe beverages to drink. This was long before we had purified water of all sorts. So fermentation in drinks in uh, the culture of the Bible uh, was probably safer than, than a lot of just regular water. Now, at the same time, I think there are some people who their conscience uh, before God and their desires would say that I'm never going to drink alcohol uh, from a spiritual perspective. And that's not only true for people who follow Christianity. You can find people in, in every major of the world religions as well as people who don't follow uh, traditional religions who would all say, I don't want to put that into my body. And so I think from a spiritual perspective, there are certain people who will choose to abstain. Now other people, of course, they would say, um, I feel the liberty to drink, but almost everybody would, would make a distinction between being under its influence and having a drink casually. Someone coming into your church now, I mean, it's so pervasive on the West Coast, the use of uh, recreational marijuana. Someone coming into your church now and they're using that, they, they haven't seen any issues with it as far as they're concerned, uh, and, they're, and they want to follow Christ. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your counsel with them? So my counsel for everybody now, and it's interesting, where we are, uh, we have uh, in the Portland, Oregon metro area, and before I got here, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, is that really the issue for almost everybody is Jesus accepts all of us just as we are when we show up. And I, we like to say that we're all in process, whether somebody's been walking with Jesus for decades or whether they're just exploring Jesus right now. When, you, when a person comes to Jesus and decides to surrender their life to Jesus and begin following Jesus, Jesus doesn't like do a checklist. Well, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? Are you involved in this? Because if you do those things, you can't follow me. He doesn't do that. He says, will you follow me? And then as 
we walk together, I'm going to change your life. So whether it relates to uh, recreational uh, drug use of any sort, uh, lifestyle choices, I always tell people at Crossroads, if you're looking for Crossroads to be a church that just affirms you and all your decisions just as you are, then you're really not going to enjoy Crossroads because Jesus invites all of us to change. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And for all of us, those transformation happens at different steps in the journey. So we don't ask anybody, you know, to do you do this, do you do this, and if you do, you can't be here. We open the doors wide and we let Jesus sort out what he's doing in people's lives. But if someone were to ask me specifically, I use marijuana recreationally. I will talk to them about how God's only desire for you as a human being is to be under the influence of his Holy Spirit. And if you're under the influence of THC or marijuana or uh, alcohol or... Um, you know, uh, prescription drugs that you're using uh, in, in an addictive way or in a way to uh, inebriate yourself or any of those things, that that is, that is missing God's best for you. And that if you, as you walk with Jesus, he is going to ask you to change that and you have to make that decision. Yeah, what, what's been the church's position? I mean, this has been five or six years in Washington. What's been the church's position in, in even speaking to those, those changes in our society? If uh, we've got a referendum coming up that's going to legalize uh, recreational use of marijuana, where should the church be? As it's, should it even have a position to, to, to speak to those issues? Well, I think absolutely, as it relates to the government, I mean, we're blessed that we live in a society where we're allowed to vote on these issues. And uh, it's, everybody brings their faith-based beliefs into the way that they vote on issues. And so I think absolutely for a Christian, as for anybody, whatever they believe in, they're going to vote based on their own conscience. And so I think absolutely uh, Christians should vote against things that they don't agree with. They should vote for things that they do agree with. And everybody does that. It's not just true, you know, we have this discussion in our culture today where it's like, well, you shouldn't bring your faith into uh, politics. But everybody brings their faith into politics. Sure. If somebody doesn't believe in organized religion, then they bring that faith-based belief into their voting. And so I think it's totally acceptable in American culture for everyone to bring their values and vote on it. Now, ultimately, whatever the laws decide, as a follower of Jesus, I don't ask the U.S. government or the will of the people through voting to be my final authority on what is right and wrong. I believe that uh, Jesus and his word is that. And because of that, when our culture has legalized all sorts of things that I think is against God's heart, it's not good for society, but our job is not to yell at people or, or hate people because our culture has voted for things that, um, that we don't see to be uh, building up or encouraging or in the best interest of humanity or gives God glory. But at the same time, our job is to walk in the light as, as he is in the light. And, and our job is to, to live a unique life in the midst of this. And that's been true for followers of Jesus, whether it's in the Roman Empire, you know, in, in any culture, uh, we're called to live subversively uh, in the world in which we live. And how do you, how do you uh, counsel people that uh, they really are looking at the medical uh, benefits of, of legalized marijuana? How do you counsel them when it is a, an hallucinogen? A lot of other prescription drugs are as well, but I mean, it can deal with all kinds of things like depression and glaucoma and, and issues like that. How do you, how do you yeah. counsel someone in your church that it's considering uh, using marijuana for medical reasons? So, you know, and that's a great question. And I always joke that, you know, I'm not a doctor. I don't play a doctor on TV. I need you know, to and so, uh, or, you know, or on radio, none of, none of us do. But I, it really boils down to a question of conscience. So, like, mm -hmm. anytime you go to a doctor, if you get surgery, right, for pain management, they're going to most likely prescribe opioids to you. Now, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you know, under the control of a doctor's care, there is legitimate medical uh, realities that this helps in. But the problem always becomes is that if, if we begin to abuse these things, then it becomes a big problem. So I was just actually talking to someone just recently here at Crossroads where because of uh, decades of medical issues, the doctor's been talking to them about using uh, some of the, the THC, CBD uh, derivatives. And I said, well, what do you think? And they said, well, I, I really, I don't feel comfortable doing it. And I said, okay, well, great. So you're asking your doctor for alternatives. And, she, and they said, absolutely. And I said, okay, well, you're going you're gonna to try the alternatives then. And they said, absolutely. And so, you know, 
if we have something that violates our conscience, I also know people who, because of uh, past addictions, they won't go anywhere near any of the pain management opioids because they've abused them in the past. And I think that's just wisdom. You know, we have to make sure we don't put ourselves in the name of trying to get healthy in a, in a, in a more unhealthy position. So, but I think it's, if, if, it, if it's within a doctor's care, uh, and it's not being abused outside of that or even under the authority of a doctor's care, uh, there is legitimate medical uses. And I don't know that we want to say that we should never do that because it is within the doctor's care. Well, look, looking at your book, Upward, Inward, and Outward, Love God, Love Yourself, and Love Others. Tell me about your book a little bit and where people can pick that up. Yeah, so my, my book, Upward, Inward, and Outward, is... For me, it's, I wanted to write a book that was about the most important thing in Christianity. And, and really, they asked Jesus, and I believe that not only was Jesus the greatest person who ever lived, I mean, I believe he was the Savior. He was God in the mm -hmm. flesh. And because of that, he's also the greatest teacher who ever lived. And they asked the greatest person who's the greatest teacher, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing? And Jesus quoted two Old Testament scriptures, first from Deuteronomy 6, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. I call that living upward, our relationship mm -hmm. with God, or better yet, the relationship that God wants to have with us. And then the second from Le uh, the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And so I get the live inward, you love your neighbor as you love yourself, so that's inward. Your relationship with God drives the way you see yourself and your identity. And then you love your neighbor, which is outward. And so I really wanted to write a book about um, how do we cultivate this life in three directions, upward, inward, and outward. I, I call it a God-breathed system for living. And it, you, people can pick it up wherever they like to buy books, obviously. Okay. Um, Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, all of the, uh, the mail order uh, places, they all have it. Uh, if you go to a store that actually has books, I know that's kind of a, a lost, uh, <laughs> a lost art in our culture, but uh, they might have it there or you can ask them to get it for you. Well, after speaking to you about this, there's a lot of other things we want to talk to you about, Daniel, so we want to get you back on the show. Again. Oh, I would love that. Next on Viewpoint, are our habits of media consumption helping or hurting us? We think of ourselves as maybe a more enlightened version of Christianity. That and more when Viewpoint returns. A recent survey tells us that one in four Americans say they're online constantly. And if you're watching us now on a smartphone, you might be one of those statistics. Well, today, many say what I choose to do in my own home is no one's business. But my next guest might disagree with that. Jonathan Burke is a pastor and adjunct professor at Bluffton University. Glad to have you with us. Thanks, Bob. Glad to be L here. Let's just clear it real quick. It, are, are people going to go to hell because they're watching Netflix and too much YouTube and that they're not paying attention to anything else? It's a good question. And honestly, it really depends on what your definition of hell is. Yeah. I mean, for Jesus said, I've come to proclaim the breaking in of the kingdom of God. And he says, you know, I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I, think that, I think that for those of us who spend a, a lot of our time on our smartphones, on social media, or Netflix binging, or whatever it may be, engaged in media, I think we ought to be asking the question, how is this shaping me? And is the kingdom of God breaking in because of my life? or have these things become a distraction become or a, a substitute yeah. or yeah a wall of participating in heavenly fellowship being a part of the work of the church of the kingdom of god here and now so in and of itself you, you're watching this it's, it's not like you say it's, it's going to shape you but at the same time the church used to people used to believe that the church would say that those things in themselves are sin going to a movie having a tv going dancing mixed bathing in a, in a yeah, municipal right, pool, right, things right, like that. Right. Those used to be things right. that, pe that some people in the church would say, those are, those are sin, you can't do those things. Well, I think that the teaching of the church, drawing hard lines, saying things are sin, whether they're sin or not, mm -hmm. some, a version of legalism, the intent of drawing those lines is really to shape people. So, yeah, maybe watching, watching a movie, I wouldn't say is a sin, but the movies that you do watch, what's the content yeah. of them? And how is that shaping you? My wife and I were watching a film uh, the other day that I didn't think had any sexually explicit content in it. And I don't watch a ton of movies. Mm -hmm. Movies aren't necessarily my thing. But we're watching this film and this scene comes in and I fast forward it and I move on to the, the next scene. But I realized for my mind who doesn't take a lot of time taking in that kind of content, yeah. over the next couple of days, 
I would think about that scene or it would would come back. And really, for those of us who are spending a lot of our time watching explicit material, Mm -hmm. we need to realize that those those images, those scenes are shaping our imagination. And I think I'm more concerned with what's the imagination of the people of God today and how is it shaped? But people say, well, I'm mature enough. I can watch a movie, an occasional movie or something like that, or something on YouTube that might have some violent content or some sexually explicit content. I'm mature enough to, to get through all well, that. Yeah, th- I'm not going to carry it with me. Well, that's a, comp- that's a ridiculous thought. It's as if, as if maturity is some sort of immunity. And it's mm-hmm. not. It's yeah. not. We're human. Mature mm-hmm. people are mature enough to say no. Mature people have self-control. It's immature people that don't realize their own humanity, that think they're above some sort of indulgence and that that's not going to shape them. Maturity is really, um, it's evidenced by one's ability to say no to particular things and to have self-control. Right. You know, we've been talking a lot about media as a consumption that we're taking in, but at the same time, in today's society, we're putting out a lot of media individually. That can be just as devastating. I don't think many of us think of ourselves as media producers. <laughs> no. But the fact of the matter is, 20, 30 years ago, the only people with video cameras and the only thing publishing content to put online mm-hmm. or streaming things uh, for TV for people to consume were professionals, right. people who were qualified to do so, people with communications degrees, people who knew how to speak who politically correct. had sensors behind them. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Today, that's not the case. We are all media producers and for for whatever reason with that freedom with that power that we have we have not taken the care to think critically about how we can damage our own image and also damage the feelings and the beliefs of other people through our just liberal production of our own thoughts via our Facebook page, our Twitter, mm. or videos that we post online. People are creating this stuff at the same time. They're being, they're being colored. What they create is being colored by what they're watching on media. And they think, well, it must be okay. I can go ahead and create this. I can go ahead and say this. Something very nasty or evil about somebody I don't care about or I don't like their politics. Sure. Uh, it, it becomes a thing where it, be, it, it, it starts to color who we become even in the media. Absolutely. And we also re- develop a different perception of ourselves yeah. A lot of us wouldn't say the things person to person that we would post online. And in that Isn't way, we, that become, amazing? we become very unhealthy as <laughs> yeah. a society. There's a cyber reality that is not personal reality. Right. And you can hide behind that. Yeah, I, can be, I can be somebody else. I can be my alter ego if I want to be. Right. And Christian fellowship is grounded in person to person, not in some sort of smoke screen that we have when right. we engage with people online. So what's led to the, I mean, the f- fact that some people are even addicted to their cell phones. They can't get off of their cell phones. They can't get away from, from media in some way. They've become addicted to that. What, what is, it? Is, is, is the addictive part of that? Is, that? is that sin? Is that, I mean, it's drawing them into that they can't stay away from their, fel- their I cell think, phone. I think culturally we have accepted th- some things as normal, mm-hmm. which maybe are not helpful to us. And again, I'm not a professional psychologist. There are some psychologists out there that would have great things to say about our collective psyche. But as a theologian and as a pastor, what I would say is our priorities have shifted where maybe in the church years ago, the theological priorities that led people to create particular legalisms or particular Mm -hmm. rules, they aren't there anymore. Because as a society, we have these myths. We think to ourselves, oh, I'm more mature than people that came before me. Oh, I can handle these things. Or we, are, we think of ourselves as maybe a more enlightened version of Christianity that don't need to have boundaries or parameters, which Jesus, Jesus came and said, you know, you've heard the law says this. Well, I've come to take it further, right. not to make it less. And I think we have this misconception that Christianity is in some way a lessening of laws or guidelines when really Christianity following Jesus is a whole, holistic, whole life, whole mind, whole heart engagement and dedication to the ways of Jesus. Well, how, do, how do we know we're, we're indulging too much? I mean, how do you judge the, the fact that I mean, so many people are on media constantly and as media has, has kind of just enveloped our society, uh, the content on there has also gotten more and more 
uh, violent, more risque, more explicit. Sure. And so you watch a little bit of it and you're going to see more of it than what you saw 10 years ago. I think that a good measure for people is really to ask themselves honestly and critically, what are my appetites and what are the things that, are, that I'm thinking about most? Mm -hmm. Because really those are two those are two pretty good gauges on the things yeah, that are What's your my mind tied up in most of the time? Right, right? Those, those are good gauges for, what's, what, for things that have become our priorities. And I think that for those of us who would follow Jesus, I think that we need to be asking ourselves critically, critically the question consistently, what is my mind thinking mm -hmm. about consistently? Paul teaches whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, mm -hmm. whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable. Right. If anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Mm -hmm. Think about such things. Are we filling our minds with things that fulfill those right. requirements? How do, how do we relate to someone who we know has crossed that line? I mean, it may be a friend, it may be a, a family member. We say, you know, they're, they're just overboard. I mean, people used to get tied up in, in the old days in soap operas. And it was hard to get free from that, or romance novels, or pornography, or something. When, when you know that a, a friend or someone that you love is, is tied into that, how do you break through that wall to where they, I mean, they think they're mature enough to handle it? I, think, you, I think Jesus gives us a pretty good directive of discipleship that I don't know many of us take seriously. Just in the simple invitation that he makes to the fishermen. Hey, yeah. Peter, John, Andrew, come follow yeah. me. Come walk with me. So many people spend their time in isolation or in addiction simply because they are isolated. They don't mm -hmm. have anyone to be with. And I think that our call in a modern age is really to simplify, to just go spend time with people, to be with people. Right. If you have someone that you're really concerned about, mm -hmm. don't just talk about being concerned with them. Invite them over. Invite them to a meal. Spend an mm -hmm. evening with them. I think that could do much more than trying to convince them that they're wrong or they're right. lost in sin. But is the church equipped uh, to, to deal with this? And I mean, the church, media is big in the church. Uh, the church is in media. And uh, are they equipped to deal with, with people that, that do have the problem, have an addiction problem with it? There's a really good book out there that was done by a couple of theologians called Sticky Faith, trying to figure out what churches were effective in helping young people maintain their faith. And one of the things that they found is the churches that were best equipped to help young people maintain their faith were churches that had older people that were invested personally in the lives of those young people. Yeah. So to answer your question, there are churches mm -hmm. that are equipped to help people move away from media addiction, mm -hmm. but they're not doing anything innovative necessarily. They're just spending time spending with young people. They're investing they're in relating. young people. It's the relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, a, you're a pastor, but you're, and you've got a, a whole church in front of you, but you also are you're a family man. You've got daughters. How do you instruct them? I mean, they go to school, and, and they see everybody's got an iPad today or an iPhone or an iPod or something. And, and they're on. How do you instruct your family? So it is really easy to be overwhelmed by the big problem of culture. Mm -hmm. But the only way that I'm going to change culture is by changing or influencing one person at a time. So with my daughters, with my own family, I carve out focused time to just be with them. Focused time that we don't have screens in front of us, but that we just engage in conversation, that we play together, that we laugh together. And furthermore, for people who are in the church, I, the greatest help that I think I can be to them in giving them sort of a counter narrative or helping them maybe correct a unhealthy lifestyle of over inundation with media is to find a place a community for them to be plugged into to be a part of really the only way we're going to turn this cultural movement of uh, media excess is by personal relationships by engaging with people one-on-one -on -one. if you'd like more information about jesus christ or how to connect to a local church go to our website or facebook page we have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with Plus, I'd like to hear from you. Here's what's on the next Viewpoint. Well, the, the, the Beast is, is talking about the Antichrist, and just the very name tells you his position. Right. Mm -hmm. he, will be the, he will be in control of the world and the three major facets of your life. He will control the political affairs of your life, the economic, economic affairs of your life, 
and the spiritual. And this is a physical person. This is a physical, physical person. person. The rapture, Israel, and the Antichrist. Our guest Bill Harris helps us sort it all out and later. So we have to change our philosophies and our beliefs about success and failure. Failure is just, listen, success never happens without failure. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. You can also like and share us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube.